John Rogers is a professor of material science and engineering, biomedical engineering, neurological surgery, and by courtesy, electrical engineering, and computer science, mechanical engineering, and chemistry at Northwestern University. His current research focuses on soft materials for conformal electronics, nanophotonic structures, microfluidic devices, and microelectromechanical systems, all lately with an emphasis on bio-inspired and bio-integrated technologies. As I mentioned earlier, John's inventions are um, really disrupting wearable technology today. Welcome, John. OK, thank you very much for that introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here and to share with you some of our recent work in this area of uh, wearables. As was mentioned, uh, I'm a material scientist, uh, electrical engineer, bioengineer, so I'm very much interested in the hardware aspects uh, of wearables, with a particular emphasis on trying to fundamentally reformulate uh, the form factor, the geometry, the mechanics of electronics as it existed from the very earliest days of the invention of the transistor of the present time. Uh, into biocompatible forms, so moving away from planar, rigid uh, constructs to uh, those that have tissue-like characteristics, so geometrically conformal, uh, low uh, mechanical modulus, and uh, biocompatible uh, materials construction. Uh, and you can imagine deployment of those kinds of technologies in many places in the body. We've done a lot of work in interfaces of the peripheral nerve, the brain, the heart, the bladder. I'll focus on uh, a skin interface. Uh, in three uh, separate sections in the next uh, 25 minutes or so. Uh, the first uh, will focus on uh, wireless, battery-free, uh, skin-like uh, biosensors uh, with electronic functionality. The last piece will uh, show how you can add microfluidic uh, capture and analysis uh, capabilities to the same platforms. And then we're also lately interested in uh, ultra-miniaturized uh, forms of these kinds of devices where they have overall sort of size dimensions in the millimeter uh, scale range, not only for interfaces to the skin, but other parts of the external surfaces of the body, like the teeth and the, uh, uh, and the fingernails, give you a sense of that. So you heard a wonderful talk uh, just prior to mine on uh, the various things that you can do with uh, wrist-mounted wearables. And this is, um, you know, represents uh, sort of an explosive uh, area of um, consumer interest over the last five or uh, 10 years. We've sort of been working in this space, you know, probably for 15, so we sort of, you know, got our start in this area before you know the, the, these kinds of wrist-mounted uh, devices really became uh, popular, uh, with an emphasis on um, you know trying to sort of overcome the intrinsic limitations associated with these kinds of platforms, which you know at first blush may uh, indicate. Uh, some kind of diversity in engineering design, but basically the the, the principles are, are all the same. You know, in in the hundreds of uh, wrist-mounted uh, devices that are available today, it's basically a rigid block of planar electronics loosely coupled to the body uh, with a strap, and that can provide certain important uh, flows of information re uh, relevant to physiological health. But uh, we believe that the absence of a robust, uh, intimate interface to the skin really constrains the kinds of measurements that you can make away from those that are uh, well understood by physicians and are used uh, routinely in clinical settings. So when we got uh, a start in this area, we were uh, trying to think about you know, the ideal format for a device technology that, that integrates with, with biology. And in the case of the skin, we decided that uh, you know, a kid's temporary tattoo was kind of an interesting model uh, to con contemplate because it is a piece of man-made technology, but the way that it integrates with the skin leads to sort of a mechanically uh, imperceptible uh, form uh, of, of integration, but, but with, with that uh, intimate uh, skin contacting uh, interface for, for sort of clinical quality measurements. And so what that really means is you need to think about electronics that are ultra thin, far thinner than uh, any uh, commercial semiconductor uh, wafer-based platform that exists today, sort of in the range of five microns might be interesting. Ultra lightweight in an aerial mass loading sense, so comparable to the epidermis itself, maybe a milligram per centimeter squared. Very low in, in modulus, uh, so silicon by reference is 150 gigapascals. The brain has a modulus of about five kilopascals. The skin's around 100. So if you could generate uh, devices and, and active electronic functionality with an effective modulus matched to the target uh, you know, integration point in the body, that, that would be important as well. It needs to flex, obviously, uh, but also needs to stretch uh, for two reasons. One, to sort of conform to the complex geometrical topographies presented by the skin and uh, other uh, integration points across the body, but also because uh, these organs and these tissues themselves uh, stretch and undergo uh, deformation. So you have to think beyond uh, mechanical flexibility to, to elastic stretchability at, at a strain level, sort of in the range of 30%. By comparison, 
silicon fractures at about a 1% tensile strain. At the same time, it needs to be air and water permeable to accommodate trans-epidermal water loss. It needs to be waterproof because you need to isolate the electronics away from uh, biofluids to avoid uh, unwanted uh, leak leakage currents and, and degradation uh, mechanisms in the electronics themselves. So that's a fairly uh, daunting set of requirements. It requires fundamentally new ideas in electronic material science, uh, mechanical engineering, circuit design, device construction, and so on. What is the consequence? If you could do all of that, uh, what, what would be the uh, implication? Well, well, the opportunity would be to reproduce all sorts of you know, physiological uh, measurement techniques that are currently deployed in clinical or laboratory settings uh, into the real world for continuous uh, multimodal uh, modal, uh, monitoring. And what would be some examples? Well, you'd be able to mo monitor uh, ECG, for example, uh, continuously. Allow you to get heart rate and heart rate variability, but full ECG waveforms as well for detailed diagnostics of cardiovascular health using uh, data streams that physicians know how to uh, interpret and act upon. You might uh, think about uh, blood oximetry, photoplasmography. Another example, uh, you could uh, capture uh, the hydration state of the skin currently performed by a contacting instrument known as a corneometer that measures sort of electrical impedance and relates that to water content in the epidermis. You'd be able to do that in a continuous fashion with a sort of tattoo-like uh, electronics. You'd also be able to measure the time dynamics of pulsatile uh, blood flow through near surface uh, arteries, a technique known as arterial tonometry, commonly used in uh, the clinic to determine arterial stiffness and cardiovascular health uh, as well. So the idea would be to be, be sort of encapsulate all these kinds of uh, measurement functionalities into this intrinsically uh, wearable skin-like uh, type of platform. And I won't go through the details, but you know, through you know, the last seven, eight years, probably 100, 150 papers, we've sort of figured out how to do uh, all of that in, in the form of advanced um, inorganic-based uh, uh, electronics and sensing systems that adopt this kind of temporary tattoo-like set of uh, physical characteristics. This is an example of an early device that included a number of building blocks that you might be interested in for an electronics uh, of this form, including high-performance silicon MOSFETs, RF diodes, uh, inductors, uh, trans, uh, um, uh, capacitors, LC oscillators. There's a strain gauge uh, array. Uh, uh, a uh, temperature array, uh, inductive coil, and, and a wireless an antenna for da data transmission. So you can really do all of this stuff. And with those kinds of platforms, you can now replicate the kinds of uh, techniques uh, that I mentioned to you before. You can uh, mount these things on the chest, and you can do uh, high-resolution electrocardiography. Uh, cardi uh, and so again, you can capture not only the, uh, the heart rate and heart rate variability, but the full uh, electrical characteristic of the uh, beat cycle on a beat per beat basis. You can also uh, reproduce the functionality enabled by that handheld corneometer device, again, in a tattoo-like uh, format, to quantitatively uh, monitor and track uh, moisture levels in the skin. You can do that electrically, or in this case, you're doing it thermally. So you can measure actually the time dynamics of heat flow uh, as it moves through the surface of the skin and down into the depth of the skin. It turns out that thermal conductivity, uh, one of the two you know, uh, relevant uh, thermal uh, transport characteristics, uh, correlates uh, linearly with uh, moisture levels determined with a corneometer. You can also do arterial tonometry. So you can embed uh, piezoelectric sensing elements into these kinds of platforms, and, and you can reproduce and capture these uh, pulsatile uh, signatures of uh, blood flow through, through the surface in the skin. And in fact, you can capture uh, pulse wave velocity. So you have the opportunity to do a beat-by-beat -beat ambulatory cuffless uh, blood pressure assessment. Uh, as well with, with these kind, kinds of devices. So you can replicate all sorts of uh, clinical standards, but in many cases you can go beyond. You can begin to do things that aren't uh, commonly uh, uh, deployed, you know, e even in the most advanced uh, hospitals to, to yield additional insights into uh, physiological health. Here's one example. So uh, these devices uh, allow you to measure with millikelvin precision the temperature at the surface of the skin without modulating or impacting the uh, the natural uh, temperature of the skin because the thermal mass of these devices is exceptionally low, a very tiny fraction of the epidermis itself. You do uh, precise thermography, skin, skin thermography, uh, at a level comparable to a you know, quarter million dollar uh, IR uh, imaging system. Uh, and you can do uh, things beyond that because you can use these devices also as a way to titrate uh, into the surface of the skin specific amounts of heating. Uh, and if you do that uh, in a way uh, with a device sort of aligned to a near surface blood vessel, you can measure anisotropic distributions of uh, temperature that result from uh, heating the skin at a position directly uh, a blood, uh, above a blood vessel. And with uh, full fluid dynamics uh, modeling, you can determine from the degree of anisotropy of the resulting uh, temperature distribution, the volumetric blood flow rate through, through that 
uh, targeted uh, uh, blood vessel. And this quantitatively correlates to the, uh, the gold standard cur currently used, which is a laser Doppler based uh, instrument, which is extremely sensitive to motion artifacts, certainly never will be uh, you know, possible in a wearable format, but you can do this kind of thermal based flow measurement and, and reproduce that kind of data. So you can do continuous monitoring of uh, blood flow as well. Lot, lots of other things. I won't have a chance to get through uh, all, all the details. So here's another example. Uh, in the context of blood flow, you can capture macrovascular flow, as I illustrated in the previous slide, but you can also look at the cumulative effects of microvascular flow. So for example, uh, if you induce a derm dermatographic uh, urticaria at the surface of the skin, uh, you get increased uh, sort of vasodilation, increased uh, blood flow through capillary beds near the surface of the skin. That causes a visual reddening of the skin. It's um, uh, accompanied by a local uh, increase in temperature, which you can see there. But it's also uh, reflected in an increase in thermal conductivity because you get an additional contribution to heat flow associated with the increased uh, blood flow at the surface of the skin. So you can actually uh, track that as well. So micro and macrovascular blood flow uh, represent other things that you can measure with these kind of platforms. Many, many possibilities. I won't go through uh, all the details, but, but you can do th things in, in, in the realm of a thermal uh, characterization, thermal transport. I just mentioned that. Biopotential, not only ECG, but EMG, EEG as well, hydration. You can uh, capture uh, biofluids. I'll show you how you uh, can capture uh, well-defined quantities of sweat and how you can do onboard uh, biochemical analysis of biomarkers uh, in sweat, all kinds of mechanical properties. I'll show you some examples, strain, motion, modulus, uh, pressure. You can do optical characterization. You can also measure sounds of the body. You can capture mechanoacoustic uh, signatures of uh, uh, valve opening and closing, for example, uh, in, in, in the heart as uh, complementary information to what uh, can be inferred from uh, ECG signals. So what, what do you do with all this? And I'll, I'll give you a number of examples of sort of large-scale deployment of these kinds of device technologies on human subject studies. But this was sort of our first target uh, because we feel like this is may maybe the most compelling you know, uh, opportunity, first opportunity from, from our uh, perspective for, for these kinds of technologies. That is in the uh, context of uh, continuous vital signs monitoring in the neonatal uh, intensive care unit. So if you have a premature baby, baby, the health status is very fragile, and it's uh, critically important to be able to measure all vital signs with clinical quality 24-7. Uh, so, so that they can be uh, monitored uh, adequately. Uh, and so if you go into even the most advanced NICU units, you'll see this kind of um, hardware setup. It's basically a, a rat's nest of wires interfaced to the surface of the skin with uh, tapes and, and hydrogels and, and coupling gels uh, and so on. And this uh, works at some level. You can get high quality data streams in this way, but there are uh, clearly many disadvantages. One is that uh, for early term uh, premature babies, the skin is very fragile. It's hardly even skin. And so uh, applying and removing uh, these kinds of adhesive tapes over time can lead to uh, lifetime scarring. Uh, in many cases, a big, big problem. The other thing is that the uh, musculature of the baby is not very well developed. So the mass and uh, mechanical load associated with these wires frustrates the natural motions of the baby. Uh, and then the third problem, which is one that uh, turns out to be maybe the most significant thing, is that the presence of all this hardware really uh, frustrates the kind of mother-child skin-skin contact that's known to be so important for healthy development of baby at this uh, uh, stage of their lives. And so for the mother to hold the baby, you gotta take all this stuff off, you put it back in the isolate, you have to wire it up again. And so our thought was that if you could really make these kinds of uh, you know, epidermal electronic systems uh, work, you'd get rid of all that uh, and replace uh, you know, that, that kind of hardware with maybe uh, two, two or three patches. So this was a slide generated maybe five years ago. This was just Photoshop at that time just to sort of set the vision of what we're trying to do, keep the students on track. But it turns out you can do all of that, uh, and, and it works, and it's now uh, deployed at Lurie's Children's Hospital. I'll give you some examples in a second. The big question is, like, what are you going to do with the battery? This has to operate 24-7. Uh, and the battery really kills the mechanics and the geometry and the soft, soft construction. And, and the way you get rid of the battery is you uh, replace uh, onboard power with, with a battery uh, supply with uh, wireless power transfer. So we use um, uh, HF, uh, RF radiation to uh, wirelessly deliver uh, power to the patch, uh, and we use the same wireless frequency to do real-time uh, streaming of data back out uh, of the patch, uh, you know, with with quantitative uh, correlation to clinical gold standards. So here's an example uh, of a device with that kind of uh, construction, that, that kind of design approach uh, in, in this kind of soft, stretchable geometry designed to uh, mount on the surface of the chest. You can see the two electrode leads here, soft uh, fractal mesh designs that are uh, non-irritating to the skin, but also uh, offer a low impedance uh, measurement. 
uh, interface. So this particular uh, device will capture uh, ECG, and from the ECG, you can cap uh, determine heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration rate, and there's also a temperature sensor in this platform. It's about $2.50 worth of hardware. You put it on the surface of uh, your chest, and you can capture ECG waveforms that look like this. You simultaneously measure, uh, you know, with clinical standards, off-board electronics, hardware wired interfaces. Uh, you see uh, a, good, a good correlation uh, here. So sort of cl clinical quality data streams, radically different form factor and different sets of uh, materials. Uh, and it turns out with this kind of wireless uh, power uh, transfer scheme, you have a range of about uh, one meter, but you can deliver uh, up to about 10 milliwatts. And so that, that uh, allows you to uh, not only operate the radio for data uh, communication, but you can also operate uh, active devices such as LEDs. So here's a device similar in construction to the one I showed you before, similar design principles, but instead of measuring ECG, it measures PPG. Uh, and blood oximetry. So it has a pair of LEDs, one red, one uh, IR, and they're flashing on and off out of sequence. There's a photo uh, detector here that's measuring backscattered light. Uh, and from that kind of information, you can determine uh, continuously uh, the blood oxygenation level. You can also uh, capture, um, uh, you, you do pho pho photoplasmography uh, in this way. So it turns out those two devices, one on the chest, uh, one on the foot, allows you to reproduce full uh, vital signs information at clinical grade quality, qu quantitatively uh, corresponding to the old style hard hardware systems that I showed you before with the hardwired interfaces. This is one of the first babies. Uh, that they, they were able to deploy the technology on. You see this is the isolet, this is the NICU unit. There's one of the devices uh, that, that I described for, for capturing data from the chest. What you can't see, there's another device uh, mounted on the foot that's doing um, uh, P PPG and uh, blood, blood ox oximetry. So uh, these kinds of devices obviously uh, have uh, you know, appeal relative to uh, conventional technologies. We've done a lot of uh, premature babies. We'll come back to that in a second. We've done full-term babies as well, and in all cases, we're capturing uh, data with the standard clinical hardware, but also our epidermal electronics simultaneously. And usually that works out, uh, but this guy really did not like the wires. So we could never keep the uh, ECG le leads on his body long enough uh, to capture data using the, the conventional approach. Uh, and during our struggles with him, it was about 15 minutes trying to get, get these electrode leads to stay on his skin, he never seemed to realize there was something on his chest. And so that's the whole point of this sort of skin-like uh, design uh, approach to uh, uh, wearable uh, electronics. So we've been on about 40 uh, premature babies down to 26-week uh, 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 delivery uh, babies. Uh, uh, there's a twin in that case. So these are very, very tiny, very fragile uh, uh, babies. Uh, you know, we have full IRB approval uh, in the NICU and are consenting parents on a weekly basis. Uh, and there's a lot of effort that needs to go into sort of the, the software interface. We've seen this thing is now set up uh, to allow the resident nurses to, to run, run the technology uh, without, without our presence. So it's the ECG, that's SCG, heart sounds, uh, and there's the two channels from the uh, PPG uh, unit. So these kinds of devices are now in widespread deployment across various um, you know, hospital facilities, rehabilitation clinics in Chicago. We have devices uh, in the operating room for monitoring peripheral nerve activity in the context of surgical interventions in the spine. Uh, we have devices uh, deployed on Parkinson's patients with uh, funding from the Michael J. Fox Foundation, so we pick up early signs of tremors. The focus there is on motion. Uh, we're also uh, using these devices on individuals who are undergoing rehabilitation following a stroke. We're monitoring motion and EMG, so this is electrical signals associated with contractions of the uh, skeletal muscles. Uh, and then we're also uh, scheduled to, to launch a large uh, cohort study, 200 uh, expecting mothers in uh, January to track stress levels uh, in mothers uh, using physiological uh, multimodal measurements using these kinds of uh, devices with the idea that uh, high stress levels can have adverse effects on the gestational period. So you'd like to be able to pick up those stressful events and then uh, you know, take action to uh, eliminate them. So in these kinds of cases, especially this one, these devices will be going home, and so they really need to be you know, robust at, at a level that allow their routine operation kind, kind of in the wild. Let me give you one uh, example of an extreme case where we're doing a deployment. So we had some inbound interest from the Cubs, uh, the Chicago Cubs, uh, in uh, monitoring their, their athletes. And so just as uh, you know, kind, of, kind of an interest um, you know, uh, from, from our uh, standpoint, we decided to agree to do that. And so we deploy, deployed these devices on um, uh, major league players in their minor league clubs. And so in this particular case that I'll show you, we have a device mounted on the chest and the leg of uh, 
one of their leading pitching prospects in uh, their minor league uh, organization. And um, this guy um, you know, plays baseball for a living, and he's trying to make it to the major uh, league. So the fact that he allowed us to put these devices on, on our, uh, his body was, was a good sign uh, you know, around the skin compatibility of the uh, engineered uh, platforms. Because he won't wear anything on his wrist, and he won't wear any kind of chest strap. You know, dur during a game, but but uh, in this case there was no problem, uh, and we talked to him after the game. He said he didn't uh, uh, even realize he was wearing anything uh, as he was going through the game. So this is um, you know uh, accelerated uh, video for uh, the third and the fourth innings during an actual game. So we're doing PPG, ECG, three-axis accelerometry, and temperature, uh, and EMG on the leg. Uh, and so these are just uh, snapshots of ECG e data. Uh, very sharp uh, R peak, so you can get uh, very precise beat to beat uh, heart rate and heart rate variability. You can also get motion, which is what you're seeing down here. So these uh, sort of bipolar spikes correspond to uh, pitching, uh, pitch deliveries, uh, and these sort of monopolar uh, features correspond to times when he's uh, dipping down to grab uh, his, his rosin bag. Uh, you can kind of see that there. He dips down, you see that. Uh, and this noisy feature it turns out uh, he delivers a pitch here. Uh, and, the, and the batter, uh, batter gets, gets a hit, and we'll see him uh, cover the bases here in a second. Another pitch, dip, grab, grab the rosin bag, and then he'll deliver a pitch here, and, uh, and you'll see, oh, this, this is not <laughs> coordinated anymore. There's something wrong with the video. Anyway, so, so you can see him running around, and the, these kinds of features are uh, corresponding to him you know, uh, run, run, running the, the bases. So you can pull out uh, with uh, pretty simple data analytics approaches, uh, you know, information content from those raw data streams. Here's something that, that was kind of interesting for us. This is timeline and heart rate. And you'll notice, first of all, that the heart rate is extremely high when he's in the game. This is third inning and fourth inning. This is uh, you know, a world-class athlete. His heart's running at 180 beats per minute uh, when he's in the game. And you see enhanced variability here. This is when uh, batters start getting uh, hits off of him. Uh, and you can see stress levels uh, building up as reflected in that kind of increased variability in heart rate. The other thing that I found to be interesting is this asymmetric dip down to a much lower baseline level when he's in the uh, dugout. Uh, it's asymmetric in the sense that the heart rate decreases slowly as he moves from on the field to the dugout. But then he goes the, from the dugout back onto the field, it's almost instantaneously jumping back up to this very high level, indicating it's probably uh, this high heart rate is driven more by stress than physical exertion. Uh, and this, this is kind of interesting data that you can pull out uh, from these kinds of uh, measurements. So that's uh, sort of an em emphasis on soft skin-like electronics. The other way to go in terms of body integration is try to make the devices so small that the mechanics aren't so, so important as, as a physical uh, characteristic. And that really um, you know, uh, reduces to the question of how do you make the antennas uh, ultra miniaturized, because the electronics themselves can, can be uh, very small. And so we spent a lot of time on this in, in designing HF antennas that could be uh, you know, encapsulated in overall areas that are sort of in uh, have, having uh, millimeter scale uh, dimensions. It's sort of a, a, a dual la uh, layer antenna structure that, that leads to resonant behavior between these two coils allow you to do this. Uh, but the interesting consequence is you can begin to think about mounting wearables in maybe non-traditional spaces. So the devices are so small that you can uh, you glue them onto the uh, fingernail, which is kind of an interesting complementary point of integration to the, to the skin. Uh, because there are no nerve endings, the growth rate of the nail is very slow, and there's no sweating or transepidermal wa water loss. So you can imagine devices integrated onto the nail remaining there for many, many months, as opposed to sort of an upper limit of integration time of uh, you know a couple of weeks uh, on, on on the skin. And this platform allows you to uh, you know pack a lot of uh, functionality you know into the space in in the middle of that antenna. So here's an example of doing uh, PPG blood oxygenation measurements in, in, in uh, you know, this kind of uh, millimeter scale uh, device. So maybe, maybe opening up some uh, interesting complementary opportunities in, in wearables. Let me conclude with a, uh, a final you know, comment on, on something that's maybe, maybe our most recent you know, uh, effort in this direction. It's this question of you know, how do you uh, go beyond electronic sensing and, and measuring physical properties associated with the body, thermal conductivity, motion, strain, optical characteristics of the skin, to something uh, more in the realm of biochemistry. And uh, in order to do that, you really have to have an ability to capture and store and then do analysis on biofluids. And we decided to start with sweat. And so the question is, can you create microfluidic platforms that have this same soft, skin-like set of physical characteristics? Turns out you can do that. I won't get into the details, but you can build microfluidic networks that interface to the skin and allow eccrine sweat glands to pump sweat directly up into this 
uh, platform, and then we use colorimetric chemical reagents to uh, do a uh, readout of uh, different biomarkers in, in sweat. So in this case, we can measure the total sweat loss at any given time uh, due to sweat that moves from this particular inlet into this serpentine channel, which is filled with a uh, cobalt chloride material that upon uh, chelation undergoes a color change. You just visually read out uh, you know, the extent of filling of that channel. And then uh, four reservoirs in the center that each fill up uh, due to uh, pumping of uh, sweat glands at different inlet locations on, on the bot bottom side of the platform of the device, the skin interface side. And uh, the colorimetric chemistries we uh, developed allow us to do a uh, readout of lactate, chloride, glucose, uh, and pH. We get total sweat loss and uh, quantitative measures of uh, these, these four uh, biomarkers as a starting point. And so you can use your uh, smartphone, you capture the color, you do the color extraction, and you can get quantitative information that way. So we work with Gatorade. They're interested in uh, a low-cost uh, device platform they can distribute to their customers, tell them when they need to drink more Gatorade, basically it. And uh, we have uh, deployments as well with various sports organizations and the DOD as well, and in this case, active duty uh, airmen at Wright-Patterson uh, Air Force Base. So in that kind of uh, construction, you sort of get average biomarker uh, concentration during a physical exercise event. The DOD folks wanted to be able to get time information, to be able to chrono sample uh, sweat. And it turns out there are ways to design these kind of platforms that undergo sequential filling of separate distinct reservoirs in, in this platform. Here's an example of this. There's a number of uh, passive valves built into the platform. This, this reservoir fills, then this one, then this one, and you can subsequently extract those tiny volumes of sweat and get a time course uh, you know, picture of how biomarkers are changing dur during uh, an exercise event. And this is a, a sort of an extraction uh, approach for, for pulling sweat out. So you can actually uh, track uh, concentrations of these different chemistries uh, over time. So with that, let me uh, conclude. I talked to you about skin interface electro uh, electronics, various applications we're pursuing there. Alternative embodiments where you focus on overall size and dimension and alternative points of integration and the ability to integrate uh, microfluidic capabilities uh, in, into these platforms uh, as well. And so with that, let me just conclude by acknowledging uh, support for the Center for Biointegrated uh, Electronics, newly endowed uh, center that we started uh, last year at Northwestern and uh, a lot of incredible work by a very talented set of uh, graduate students, postdocs, and undergrads. Thank you very much.